The academic units at Columbia that are sponsoring this international conference, and especially the Free Translation Columbia is provided. Coalition, for inviting me to participate. I welcome this opportunity to associate myself with those who are on the front lines of the campaigns against the genocide inflicted on the Rohingya. I'm especially happy to encounter, uh, virtually at least, Professor Radhika uh, Kumara Swami, whose UN work on gender violence had an important impact on US activists. I vividly remember when she was barred from visiting women's prisons in Michigan in 1998. Over the last decade or so, I've always attempted to make connections between a range of social justice struggles, especially those that highlight feminist resistance to state violence and the ongoing struggle for justice in Palestine. Last spring, I had the opportunity of speaking on the same platform as Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak at a symposium in Berlin entitled Planetary Utopias, Hope, Desire, Imaginaries in a Postcolonial World. There, I tried to point out that we needed to accelerate our international solidarity campaign with the Palestinian people. When I was speaking about this um, uh, during the conversation uh, with Gayatri, she pointed out that the situation of the Rohingyas should also be placed at the center of our justice agendas. During her formal presentation, Gayatri spoke about and included images of the Rohingya fleeing military assaults, assaults in Rakhine State. While I had read stories about the plight of the Rohingya, and I had seen media images, this was the first time I had heard anyone appeal directly for solidarity with the Rohingya. I thank you, Gayatri, for bringing these issues to our attention and for urging us to realize that the importance of standing with the Rohingya resides not only in the fact that they are the targets of genocide and crimes against humanity, which of course they are, and this should not be underestimated, but what is even more important is that these attacks are often minimized because they are perpetrated under the guise of spreading democracy. When people learn how to identify with those who are the victims of repression, racist repression, anti-Semitic repression, they often have a hard time imagining that those who have been victimized can also become perpetrators. This failure to acknowledge the seemingly contradictory ways in which history often unfolds sometimes has the effect of cloaking horrendous and often systematic acts of violence and terror. Cloaking violence and terror behind sympathy with a previous victim status of the perpetrators. Thus, it is often the case that when we call for the recognition of the human rights of Palestinians, or we suggest that a boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement is a historically tested, nonviolent mode of resistance, we are asked the question, do you agree with Israel's right to exist, as if states have rights, as if Jewish citizens of Israel do not also criticize their state, and as if that question itself were enough to further um, silence all discourse. In my personal situation, a human rights award that was offered to me was rescinded, so I understand, because of my solidarity with the Palestinians. 
In the case of the Rohingya, the residences of the international campaign to free Aung San Suu Kyi from her more than a decade and a half in detention caused her name to be linked to the movement against to the movement to free political prisoners and to the quest for democracy in Burma. And to remember primarily how she was raised up in the past as a symbol of democracy in the world, how she won the Nobel Peace Prize and how she was called the spiritual heir to Gandhi's nonviolence. But many people around the world are recognizing that her past elevated position as a putative icon of democracy cannot conceal her part and the role of the military in enabling and in justifying the genocide against the Rohingya. We know that during the last period some 700,000 Rohingya have been forced to flee Rakhine State and are now in refugee camps in Bangladesh. That is almost a million people, one third of whom are children, 40,000 orphans, and thousands of children who are the product of mass rape by the Burmese military. We also know that within the context of the United Nations, numerous investigations have reached the conclusion that an ethnic cleansing campaign is underway in Myanmar. UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Myanmar, Professor Yang He Lee of South Korea has called for the trial of Burma's leader, starting with the commander in chief of the armed forces, whom she says should be tried for the crime of genocide. But why have we not generated more vigorous international support for the Rohingya? Recognizing that, of course, that the leadership of this campaign must come directly from the Rohingya themselves. And that those of us who are not directly affected by the conditions uh, they face should be seeking ways to link this international solidarity with the Rohingya, with the work that we do against racism, especially recognizing that Islamophobia is not only an outrage in itself, but that it has deepened, complicated, and rendered more corrosive racism directed against Black people, against Latinx people, and against other marginalized communities. The xenophobic call for a wall to prevent Central Americans from entering the US, including women and children, and those who are seeking asylum because of practices and femicide in countries like Guatemala, is not unrelated to the practices of driving the Rohingya from their homes. The militarization of the US police forces often trained in so-called anti-terror methods by the Israeli army is one example of the way Islamophobia has affected institutions of state violence inside the US as the Rohingya are targeted by Islamophobic violence in Burma. The intensified campaign against gender violence and sexual abuse that we have witnessed over the last period would greatly benefit from linkages with the brutal rapes of Rohingya women and the violent attacks against Rohingya children. We would be much more likely to recognize the structural dimension of rape and gender violence more broadly. As a longtime activist in anti-racist and anti-prison movements in the US, and as a former political prisoner, I can directly attest to the effectiveness of international solidarity. We stood against South African apartheid. Many of us support women and men in Brazil, who despite the assassination of Mirielle Franco, 
see themselves as agents of a future democracy. We are aware of the power of such campaigns. This is a period in which increasing numbers of people are standing against the Israeli occupation of Palestine. It is important to expand this collective consciousness and to recognize the indivisibility of justice. I therefore join all of those around the world who stand with the Rohingya, who stand with the Kachins, the Sam, the Karim, the Rakhini, and other oppressed people. Just as Palestinian civil society followed the example of the boycott against apartheid South Africa, we support the call for a similar boycott of Burma. Most importantly, we recognize the leadership of the Rohingya and their right to determine their future. Thank you.